Welcome everyone to a special edition of the American Mind. Uh, it's going to be on the podcast, but we we were here in Newport Beach for our Lincoln Fellowship, and Michael Anton was here as well. So we thought we would uh, record it uh, for a special edition. Uh, Michael Anton, of course, is a research fellow and lecturer at Hillsdale College. He's also a senior fellow of the Claremont Institute. I'm your host, as always, Ryan Williams, president of the Claremont Institute, publisher of the Claremont Review of Books and the American Mind. I uh, hope you enjoy this interview I did with Michael about his upcoming book, The Stakes, America at the Point of No Return, available September 1st from Regnery. Uh, I thought I'd start with um, this question that's on everyone's mind. You famously wrote the Flight 93 election uh, in September of 2016, right before the election, um, under a pseudonym, Publius Decius Moose, and, uh, or just Decius, as it was known. Um, a famous figure from Roman history, and uh, there's actually three of them, but right. we can we, we don't have to go there. Yeah. Uh, at the time, <laughs> all famous for exactly the same thing. So, <laughs> at the time, you're in the, uh, the the private sector and were worried about your job. Uh, it turns out justifiably so, uh, and but you were soon soon outed, and then you joined the Trump administration. But that that essay argued that really that election in '16 was um, existential, yeah. and at the time, people said it was histrionic. Um, yeah. I think you've been fully vindicated. I think. And yet m people still say it's histrionic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, What I've noticed, though, is that more people on the left are saying that about this from their angle, that if Trump wins again, it, you know, it's flight 93 for the Democratic Party, which I think is completely insane. I think even if the president does win again, the Democrats will still have control of the administrative state, the universities, the media big corporations, virtually every power center in America will have an excellent shot at retaking the White House in 2024 and then at ushering in the kind of permanent blue state, coast to coast, one party majority that they were on the cusp, I thought, of winning in 2016, which is why I originally yeah. wrote that. So I, I, you know, just goes to show you how one can look at the same phenomena from two different angles and see it completely differently because I don't think they, they have really anything. I mean, yes, they'd rather not lose, but the idea, if we lose, I do think we are at risk of never winning uh, a national majority again. Um, whereas if they lose, they'll get it back sooner rather than later and probably hold it forever. Yeah. Well, some of our critics, some of our friends too say, so you offered partly a response already, but what do you say to them when they say, what is now every, every election yeah. a Flight 93 election? What, Unfortunately, it is for now. I wish it were not so. Um, I wish it weren't. And, but we're not in that, we're not in, the country isn't in the state that it was in 50 years ago, 70 years ago when, um, you know, the parties routinely traded power and recognized the legitimacy of the other side. Now you could say, What's he talking about? Actually, because we've had a fairly regular transfer of power since um, Reagan won three terms in a row, uh, Clinton won two, Bush won two, or, well, Reagan won two terms and then Bush won one, um, Clinton won two, Bush won two, Obama won two, and now Trump. So there has been an alternation. What is Anton talking about? Well, my view is if you look at the trend, uh, for instance, the last time a Republican even got a majority of the popular vote was George W. Bush in 2004. Bear, bear, bear majority. Um, uh, Trump didn't get it. In fact, he lost the popular vote bigly, one might say. Um, and it'll be hard for, I mean, who knows what may happen. There, there could be so much disgust for the rioting, looting, pillaging, and the woke insanity of 2020 that a silent majority will emerge and sweep Trump back into office with both an electoral and popular majority. But if you simply just look at demographic trends, the way um, red states have trended purple, purple states have trended blue, You'd have to say the electoral math long term looks very, very bad for the Republicans and has been headed in only one direction for a generation. So that's to me is the, the reason why I, I think it's we're not trading power back and forth the way you know most political scientists would say a healthy democracy is not is a, is a multi party or at least a two party state and not one where one party always wins and the others are irrelevant. You actually, each side has a chance to win, implement parts of its program, make compromises with the opposition, um, knows that it will lose again at some point, go back into opposition, and so has an incentive to moderate its program while it's in office and to make compromises while it's out of office. Um, we don't live in that kind of politics right now. Right now, it, it all feels existential, um, and it feels to me that what the left, the Democrats, they really want to get in power and 
hold it forever. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I have no doubt I will be accused of projection, and people will say that no, this is what you want. This is what the Democrats. This is what the Republicans want. This is what Trump wants. Um, I know that I don't want that personally. I, I know the president. I, 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 I can't say I know he doesn't want that because who can look into a man's soul? But I have no indication from him that that's what he or his followers want. He, his followers feel like they've been getting the short end of the political stick and the economic stick for a generation. And they feel that way because they have. It's an accurate assessment of their situation. And it's not like it was when you know, the Democrats would come in and address income inequality and with social programs and these, the Republicans would come in and address overregulation and strangling taxes for growth. You know, each side had a sort of part, you know, as Aristotle says in his politics, right? Um, po ultimately, there are you know, partisan claims to justice. And the problem with these claims is not that they're not true, but that they're partial, right? So the side that favors the little guy and uh, you know wealth inequality and the you know the distribution of good things has a point. They will they will if left unchecked take their point too far, right? But the the side that favors wealth um, production, creation, and innovate also has a point. If left unchecked, they will take their claim too far. Um, Ironically, the Republican Party was always the party of the latter, of that is to say of wealth creation. It's not so much anymore. The party, the, the party of the rich, of the upper class, of the, of the oligarchs is the Democratic Party. And they are all for a kind of political and economic philosophy of neoliberalism that will keep giving the short end of the stick to the middle class, to middle America, and to the working class. Um, if they you know, get power and take it back, I. I think that the trend that we've seen for the last 30, 40 years will only intensify and accelerate, and that worries me very much. Yeah, and they were, um, in a way, convinced they were on the cusp of a semi-permanent That's what I think, permanent yeah. majority in 2016. Right. I mean, they, they, they lie about this. and they, you know, There's something, I, I coined the phrase, I don't know that it will catch on. It's maybe not very catchy, but I've thought about this for a long time. I, what am I going to call this? There's a phenomena in American public discourse now where the same exact fact pattern if spoken by a certain person, is celebrated, uh, and that person lauded. And, 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 but if a different person says it, because they can be presumed to either be in opposition or simply not to be in favor or to take in, they, it, it, it would be denied that the sentiment even exists and that person will be attacked. I call it the celebration parallax. So a parallax is, this, is, is just a phenomenon where the same exact object viewed from a different angle appears differently. So for instance, if you're the driver in front of an analog speedometer, you, you may think you're going 60. Right? But somebody in the passenger seat looking at it from a different angle will see a different number. So uh, the, it's a, a long wind up to say, look, the, the Democrats, uh, there was a famous book that came out in 2002 by left liberal political scientists or commentators called The Emerging Democratic Majority. And it basically said, because of demographics, the Democrats will soon have a majority and isn't that great. It's Judas and Tashera. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, now, I think the thesis of the book is correct. They maybe predicted, uh, maybe their prediction took longer to happen, to unfold, than they, than, they, than they thought. But the basic trend line is correct. So here's the thing. If you are in favor of a permanent democratic electoral majority, then it's, it, it's, it's a fact. You can say this is happening and isn't it great for our side. But if I say the same exact thing, they're about to get a permanent blue majority. It's called a conspiracy theory. It's a lie. It's me hate-mongering and fear-mongering. And I, I, the, the, the thesis is denied, and I get attacked as a bad person for saying the exact same thing that people who want this to happen say and are celebrated for it, and, and the thesis is affirmed. Right? So I think that's exactly what happened, is that 2016, they thought Hillary would win, that dem, you know, um, demographics were on their side. You know, they were on the right side of history, to use Barack Obama's um, famously oft-reputed phrase, except he more often said wrong side of history. But if there's a wrong side, there's a right side, right? And so they thought, we have the coalition of the future. We can't lose this election. And, you know, the future, you know, we're, we are the future in a sense that, you know, these new economies, um, uh, new types of businesses, new types of social arrangements that predominate in the blue coasts uh, and in university towns and places like that are supplanting forever old, staid, boring, but also you know, racist and bigoted, uh, outmoded middle America. And then, you know, the, you know all their, their social arrangements, their industries, everything about this, you know, the kind of flyover country was the past. And we were the coalition of the future. And, and 2016 I, I, was an unbelievable shock.
to a lot of people who were certain, not just that Hillary was going to win, but that that coalition was, that the, the thesis of the 2002 book had finally come into its own and the victory would be permanent. And I think that explains a lot of the hysteria over the last three and a half years and counting. Yeah, including Russiagate and all the rest. Absolutely, right? including Russiagate, including impeachment, including what's going on now. You know, there's a sense, um, I just read, I wish I could remember who wrote it, but I can't off the top of my head, but I just read this, the other. I think it's a problem when you get old, you get a little bit, free, as, as you know, everybody, uh, I sympathize with Joe Biden in a sense, I get a little forgetful myself, but somebody wrote the following, like, it, it's, it's not enough, it seems like there, there's a class of people for whom even an overwhelming Democratic victory in November of 2020, an electoral and a popular vote victory, isn't enough. They've got to topple, they've got to get Trump out of power in some humiliating extra constitutional way for it to be emotionally satisfying enough. I think that's happening. And it was Michael Brendan Doherty, now I remember, he's, he's the one who said that. Uh, and I, I think that that is happening right now and it explains all of this stuff. It explains, I think, you know, in the early days of the COVID lockdown, I didn't know what to make of it. Was this going to be a massive pandemic? Is it going to cause all of this death? And one had to keep an open mind because I, what do I know? I'm not an epidemiologist. And I had a lot of friends who say, nah, this is totally overblown. And I said, well, we'll wait and see. I don't know. I think the verdict is in. It's the early fear mongering from February, March into April has not panned out the way people said it was going to pan out. Um, you know, millions and millions of deaths worse than the 1918 and so on and so forth. And if you go back and try to read op-eds or look at some media from that time, you will see confusion. There weren't clear sides like, you know, Republicans or conservatives or red state people wanted X. And, uh, but after a time, it became very, very plain that everybody, you know, that blue America, broadly speaking, insisted on we have to have a lockdown and an economic shutdown. Now, why do they coalesce around that? Well, some of that I'm sure is people just believe this is super dangerous and they'll catch it and die. But I think some of them also, I think there's a lot of it, and some people have said this openly, that oh, locking down the economy and jacking up unemployment um, and you know hurts Trump, so we have to do that. Right? And maybe it'll help us get him out of office sooner. Um, I think the, uh, the woke riots of 2020, in which there haven't been a lot of red cities destroyed in woke riots, but a lot of blue cities have been destroyed in woke riots. I mean, what do we call this? It's a kind of like, it's a weird form of pagan sacrifice where you destroy your own city in order to what? To get the orange man out of office early? I don't know. It's, it's strange to me. Well, as a Black Lives Matter activist said in Chicago the other day, yeah. you know, uh, this is just reparations. Looting is reparations. And right. they have insurance. So it's, right. you know, it's kind of, nobody right. pays really. I don't know. I have to tell you, um, you know, the cities look weird, very weird. I mean, I, I, I've been into downtown a couple of a couple major cities recently. Well, not, not often, but enough, just a few times, and they're deserted, um, not entirely empty. It reminds me of the scene in War and Peace where Tolstoy talks about Moscow after the Battle of Borodino. So there's this giant battle outside of Moscow with Napoleon and the Russians. General Kutuzov, and each side thinks they're winning, and then when it's over, both sides realize that neither one really won. They just lost a lot of guys, and now what do they do? And Kutuzov realizes he can't defend Moscow, so they evacuate the city. And the way Tolstoy describes what the city was like, after, you know, it wasn't completely empty. There were some people there, but it was like, let us put it, put it this way, not the best people <laughs> remaining, right? Um, the cities are like that. now. They're boarded up. Things are closed. There's a lot more homeless. The homeless are a lot more brazen and aggressive about panhandling and just about being, you know, in various levels of antisocial behavior. You read the stories out of Manhattan. I've talked to friends who live in Manhattan. Um, it's, it's heartbreaking, especially as someone who really loves America's great cities, to see this happen in a way deliberately with the leadership's full participation and approval and complete refusal to do anything about it. And you have to, I mean, I, I wonder, I mean, is this, just, is this just woke cultism? Because what is New York City? Well, ultimately, it's the global capital of finance and media in the entire, for the entire, global, the entire world, right? This is a city that went through a near-death experience within living memory, painstakingly came back to life, and then was, in a way, reborn as greater than it's ever been. Um, and they gave all that up in a, in a couple of months. They've seemed, they've, I don't know that they've killed it forever, but they seem to have at least gravely harmed it for a generation, if not more. And what does blue America get out of destroying its own great cities? I don't, I don't know, but they, they, either they have a master plan that I have not discerned, 
or they're, they're so invested in this woke cultism that they just can't stop themselves. Yeah. Well, let's get back to the book more explicitly. Um, you brought up the question of justice and the parts of the city from Aristotle that pursue certain parts of justice. Uh, in chapter two of your book, you talk about the parchment of yeah. America, the parchment regime of America, how it ought to be, how, mm -hmm. how we know it from the founding. We're here at our Lincoln Fellowship in lovely, uh, a lovely undisclosed location in Southern California, uh, <laughs> teaching some mid-career folks for a week about the founding, about the Civil War, the slavery crisis, about modern conservatism and liberalism, how they ought to think about America. Um, what, what is, who gets equality right and wrong and why? if I can ask that broad a question. And the premise behind it is, is um, some of the critics on the right, and uh, especially those of various stripes, dissatisfied with the left and dissatisfied yeah. with parts of the right, have focused in on what is the, really the central claim of justice of America, which is human equality, and as we understand it, the equal protection of equal rights, at, really at the core of American right. political justice. I mean, if, if the question is who, to me, the greatest, aside from Jefferson himself, who wrote the words, and we can all criticize Jefferson for various things, but the, the greatest interpreter of equality in American history is, is Abraham Lincoln, without any question. Um, look, I sympathize with those critics on the right to a point, but you know, to use a tired cliche, I suppose, they really are throwing the baby out with the bathwater if they say, um, well, the only answer, equality got us into this mess, we must ditch equality. Well, I, first of all, I, I don't think it's true that equality got us into this mess. Um, you could argue somewhat plausibly, and I think accurately to an extent, that misunderstanding of equality got us into this mess. And some would then further say, well, look, even if you think you have the, you know, the correct understanding of equality and the founders got it right and all of that, you have to say that the fact is it was misinterpreted and it led to all of this leveling and so on and so forth, and therefore it's, it's, it's problematic in and of itself. Um, I don't buy that. I don't think it necessarily that founding a regime based on equality in the sense that the founders and Lincoln understood it had to lead to the mess that we're in now. And I also think that the people who try to throw it out are making a prudential mistake because if we're going, you know, if we, if we could have, you know, a, a symposium of right-wing critics of the founding, right-wing critics of equality, and me around a table, say, mm -hmm. and we all said, okay, the first topic for discussion is America in 2020. What's wrong with it? We're going to agree on almost all of that, on all of it. And then the second topic would be, how do we fix it? What do we want to see? I think we're going to agree on most of that. And then the third is, on what, on what basis are we going to establish these fixes, right? And I'm gonna, I, I would just try to quiz these guys. Okay, you don't like equality. Well, how are you going to... What's your solution? Um, I know I'm not making right now a positive. Who gets to rule and right, why? Right, who gets to rule and why? I mean, are we going to create dukes and earls and marquises again? Because, you know, uh, and, and how? I mean, God is probably not going to come down and start anointing people, which means we're going to have to make it based on human choice, and everybody's going to know it's made up. These titles of nobility or these titles of differentiation are made up. The people who don't get to be in the top but are in the middle or the bottom will probably be resentful. This is pretty impractical. What equality ultimately is... Um, you know, as Lincoln said, it was a standard maxim from a, for a free society. Um, it's, it's fundamentally a claim to political legitimacy, right? Um, not to say that monarchy is always unjust or always illegitimate. Um, I think there are circumstances, and you know, there can be, a, there can be just constitutional monarchies. But, but the, for the founders, any rule without consent is unjust, right? And equality is the fundamental way it's, it's, it's both the way that consent is secured, but it's the, it's the you know, metaphysical or pre-political grounding of why consent is required, right? I own myself. I own my labor. I own my conscience, right? I need to be part of a political community. We all do, unless you're an anarchist, in which case you're just an idiot. Um, I need to be part of a political community because, the, you, you know, as Aristotle says, we come together in a political community to do together what we cannot do or can't do well alone. Right? So collective defense, um, basic provisions, but also any kind of level of civilization requires cooperation, which means it requires politics, which means it requires rule. All right, so I don't want to be ruled without my consent. I, I, I don't want to be, to be ruled without my consent since I own myself and I need to be part of a political community. To be ruled without my consent de facto makes me a subject or a slave, and that's unjust inherently. Now, Aristotle's well aware, and the, the founders don't disagree with him at all, that talents, virtues, vary a great deal 
among men. But you know, Thomas Jefferson famously put it in a letter. Um, yes, there are superior examples of human excellence. You know, for instance, he says uh, he mentions Isaac Newton. He says Isaac Newton is superior to me in understanding. Right? He's the smartest man on the. You know, he could think Thomas Jefferson could think of at that time. But that doesn't make him my natural ruler. Even nor does it make me the natural ruler of someone who's much dumber than I am, according to Jefferson, right? Everybody is simply by being virtue of being a human being and um, you know, having a soul, having logos, speech or reason, or you know, freedom of thought, has the right to only be governed with their consent. Now, the best regime will recognize inequality and uh, encourage the best both to rule, I mean, we want you know, another letter of Jefferson where he talks about the best form of government is that which allows for the purest selection of the natural aristoi, meaning the naturally best, into the offices of government. So if you have a country of however many million people and one in them is George Washington, you definitely would like a system in which a George Washington rises to the top and rules. You don't want to say, well, because of equality, I just want to take this random guy over here because equality demands that you know, this excellent specimen um, be ruled by this other guy. No, that's not the way our system is supposed to work. The other thing too is there's a massive inequality, as I said, of talent and virtue. And you want that inequality of talent and virtue to be utilized to its fullest extent. So you want the talent and virtue of certain people. You want them to uh, develop those talents. It's useful to society. We don't want to say, wow, you're very intelligent and you'd be, make a great doctor. But because of equality, we're going to, you know, force you to stop school at eighth grade and, and you know, yeah. just plow a field forever because otherwise if you were a doctor you'd be more influential and you'd get paid more and that's terrible so let's have no doctors. Like, let's have no rich people. Let's have no this or that. That's crazy. You can't develop a civilization that way. So there's nothing that the conservative critics of equality, I think, wish to see that is not allowed for and even encouraged by the founders' vision of equality. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to deal with it. We can do it quickly. It's not a big part of your book, but I know people listening or watching this will will wonder. Well, you brought up Jefferson, uh, and of course, in the yeah. in, in America of the last year, and especially the last three months with Black Lives Matter running through the streets and the sixteen nineteen project from the New York Times. Um, I'll just state for the record, you can riff on it as much as you like. Even Jefferson, and Jefferson especially, in a way, never thought slavery was right or just, no. even though. Uh, he, yeah. he, of course, had slaves and died with slaves and never manumitted them. But, right. Yeah. Because, look, it, um, I think this is a little known fact. I hope it's a fact. I know that I've read this in a number of places. And if I'm wrong, someone will probably write an angry letter. But, you know, Washington famously freed all his slaves. And it cost him a lot of money to do so. Because Washington spent the last years of his life ensuring that every one of his slaves would have a, a, a business or a land or an amount of money, the ability to survive and sustain their lives, right? He wasn't just gonna say, you're free now, oh, and you're broke, and bye, I'll see you later, and watch people you know, suffer in poverty, right? He, he spent money to make sure that they would be able to live their lives uh, as free men. Um, Jefferson did not do that because apparently, I mean, we know this is part is true, Jefferson was a spendthrift his whole life. I mean, he just, he, just went, he just bought stuff constantly, and he was always in debt. He bought, I, I sympathize, like he went to France and he came back with you know, multiple cases of first growth Bordeaux. I would too if I had, you know, but he, he couldn't pay for it. He couldn't pay for his own house. He couldn't pay for anything. And so he knew slavery was wrong, and, but he, he was a flaw. I mean, he was a very, you know, Washington was, I think this is, we're talking about inequality, right? I think we have to say, as important as Jefferson was, as great a man as he was, as great a statesman as he was, Washington was his moral superior. Washington governed his own personal finances and his own, uh, everybody likes to have money and likes to have stuff, right? Um, but Washington was much more disciplined and he did, I think, a noble thing by saving his money and, and giving some of his wealth to free his slaves and ensure that they would have the means to support themselves as free men. And Jefferson just didn't have moral control over his passions and couldn't do that. And we should be clear about that and say that this is one of his flaws. It doesn't in any way obviate the truth of all men are created equal, in no way whatsoever. I mean, it's ridiculous for Black Lives Matter or any of these leftist movements to trash the only principle, the only consistent and sound principle on which uh, a version of, you know, I, I was going to say it's not their version of racial justice because their version of racial justice is something really perverse and sick, which is, you know, it's, it's kind of a revenge fantasy or maybe not a fantasy. Maybe it'll become a revenge reality. But, you know, in what way um, I, is all men are created equal not helpful to the cause of racial equality and not 
you know, our great teacher put it this way, Harry B. Jaffa used to say um, um, two, uh, two things, if I remember them correctly, and I won't remember them word for word. One was, it is not miraculous um, uh, that a nation of slaveholders, upon achieving its in, in independence, did not immediately free all of its slaves. What is miraculous is that a nation of slaveholders, on declaring its independence, stated in the document, in the very document, of declaring its independence, stated that all men are created equal, thereby making the abolition of slavery a, eventually a moral and political necessity, right? If the founders were cynical about this question at all, that phrase would not have been in there. They would have taken, and as we know, Jefferson himself originally penned a line in the charges against the king, the 18 charge, you know, um, saying, condemning the slave trade, and at the behest of Southern delegation, it had to be struck, stricken from the declaration. Um, the other thing Jaffa would say is, um, Second, only to the family, slavery is the oldest institution in human life. It's been practiced in every culture, in every part of the globe, among every religion, throughout all recorded history that we know of, right? And yet, uh, uh, four score and seven years after the founders declared, the American founders declared all men are created equal, was slavery finally abolished in the American continent, this thing that had been going on throughout the world for the 6,000 years that we can that we know of in recorded history. There's a direct connection between those two things. Yeah. And so uh, it's one thing to you know, complain about the hypocrisy of the American founders. There was really no place in the world in 1776 that I know of. That, I mean, England did abolish the slave trade yeah. before we did. They did it, I think, in 1833. Um, there was no place in the world where slavery was even considered, uh, you know, maybe... I mean, there must have been some place. If I say, if I, any, anytime you say no place, you get, you know, you get caught out. Somebody will be, they'll come up with some country and they go, no, they had this in their life. Wait, but in the, broadly speaking, the advanced parts of the world, nobody found this at all controversial. And as Lincoln also said, Jefferson, you know, um, Jefferson had no, there was no, neither Jefferson nor any of the other founders had any, there was no necessity, there was no reason at all to insert into a purely revolutionary document an abstract truth applicable to all men in all times. They could have just written the Dear John letter to George III exactly the same way without declaring that all men are created equal, which was a torpedo right at the waterline of slavery. And they knew what they were doing when they did it. Yeah. People forget, too, that slavery, unfortunately, is still very much with us. Yeah. yeah. Across parts of Af Africa, the Islamic world, mm -hmm. uh, debt slavery in large parts of India. Yeah. It uh, uh, continues to be a a problem coeval with human nature. Um, I want to I want to get to your regime analysis section of the book, but first we we brought up uh, equality and rule by consent. We didn't say the I think you said the word social compact, but I didn't. It, but it's in the book. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, right, uh, the, the crib crib notes version is we're, we're all equal. <clears throat> we're all created equal. We um, don't have the right to rule each other without our consent. We come together as a society, a political society, yeah. and and form it by social compact, which means to get to chapter five ahead of chapter three. Uh, we are perfectly uh, capable and we have justice on our side in saying who can and cannot come to this country and discussing what kind of immigrant would be healthy and what kind of immigrant would be unhealthy. Yeah, I think with the left and the Chamber of Commerce right, if you can call it that, and the libertarians and others have tried to insist that there's some kind of moral imperative that America must admit immigrants. It just doesn't have a choice about it. We're a nation of immigrants, after all, um, which is not strictly, it's partly true, but not strictly true. And the extent to which we are a nation of immigrants, you know, if you go back far enough, every nation is a nation of immigrants because no people on, on earth were literally born up out of the ground beneath their feet, right. the way Socrates in Plato's Republic, you know, that's the noble lie. Remember the famous noble lie in Plato's Republic is the earth is your, they were going to tell this to the citizens of the just city. The earth is your mother and you were literally, your ancestors were literally born from the ground beneath your feet. Unless that's true, you're an immigrant in some way, right? Or your ancestors were immigrants in some way. You want to go back far enough. The other thing that's interesting is when you talk about the social compact, um, every free country with any modicum of liberty has an implicit social con compact. Mostly it's implicit. Like we don't know, you know, you, you can point to milestones in which the English social compact is formed. The Magna Carta, the Glorious Revolution, the Reform Bill of 1832, in which it's formed and refined over the years. Very rarely, if ever, does it happen that you see the entire spectacle of the social compact being formed right before your eyes and it's all written down and there's eyewitness accounts. And they write the compact, right? right. 
You know, they write down a Declaration of Independence, which forms the first basis, then they write a constitution, they write the, well, the laws before the constitution, the so-called organic laws of the United States, the Northwest Ordinance, the Articles of Confederation, right? It's all completely transparent and open to public view. It doesn't happen much, but it's illuminating in that sense. So what, when you have a compact, it, it obviously must, by logical necessity, apply only to the members, the people who've consented to it. So, you know, there's a few of us in this room, only two of us are on camera, but if we all decided to form a compact right now, it would, we, it would be our compact. And then somebody knocks on the door, I want in. We could then deliberate amongst ourselves. Do we want to let this guy into the compact or don't we? we you know, we're divided. We take a vote. Somebody loot. No, sorry, you can't come in. And then somebody else comes. I want in. Yeah, what do we think? We like this one? Okay, you can come in, right? Mutual consent. Mutual consent to join the compact. You, uh, uh, immigrants essentially, we've, and we've done this successfully as a country over the years where immigrants say, I want to come there because there's liberty there and there's a booming economy there. And I think I, I and my family and future generations will do better if I'm there. And there are times when America says, yes, we, we agree. We think we'll do better if you're here because we need labor or we need this or we need that. Uh, we, we need your particular set of skills. But we also have the absolute right to say no. And that right, I don't, I think people, I think the, le the narrative of the left has gotten to the point where it doesn't recognize the legitimacy of the sovereign American people as a part of their compact to say, we want to limit immigration. We want, we don't, we want to be able to say no to X number of people or, or, or so on. Um, it's as if, you know, our, our colleague, Christopher Caldwell, wrote to me, um, still the best book of 2020 so far. It's probably, man, I, I got to be generous and say it's, it's probably better than mine, you know, Caldwell's. Mike, Caldwell. there's an interview about your book, yeah. writing your book, you can't make. <laughs> He's just a genius. Caldwell said, though, you know, the, civil, the, the way civil rights has transformed our understanding of everything, it's, it's become an illicit second constitution. That definitely applies to immigration, where immigration is now considered by a left and all the elites as a civil right for foreigners. They have a right to move here. You don't have any right to say no, which just guts any understanding of the social compact. Yeah, uh, Matthew Iglesias has a new book out called One Billion Americans, yeah. The Case for Thinking Big. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It's completely crazy. And another book that I, um, I referred to, I forgot the author's name, but he's an Indian immigrant himself, an elite guy. I mean, he's an NYU professor, so he, I assume he lives in Manhattan. You know, he's a professor in an elite school and wrote a book in which he says, he didn't exactly propose this, but he said something like, no, no, we, um, we have plenty of room. We could fit the entire population of the world. America is big enough. I'm like, does anybody want that? I mean, do any of the actual existing members of the social compact want uh, 8 billion Americans? And now, if you just look at a population density table and you say, well, there are places this dense elsewhere, therefore it could work here, it's, is that desirable for its own sake? It's crazy. This land is our land? Is that yeah, that's right? the name of the book. Yeah. 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 Catchy title. Um, it's a, it's, by the way, it's a great example of a kind of left-wing revenge porn. I mean, that's the, what that book says is because you in the West have been bad to the non-West in the past, we have the sovereign right to come to your country and take what you have. It is, it's pure, it's very open, naked revenge on his part. He tells this anecdote about his father, who's an Indian, sitting in a park, a person of Indian descent, I suppose he emigrated to London, and, and some you know, working class Englishman or whatever, it's just an anecdote, walks by his father and says, you know, in an uncouth, um, uh, we would call it very rude manner, you know, what are you doing here? And the father, I think, rudely says back, I'm here because you were there, meaning uh, I'm here, the British came to India and they robbed my country, so now I get to come to London and rob your country, essentially. And I quoted this in the book. He didn't say rob. Uh, he said rob the first time. He didn't say that about what he was doing. But the, 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 the moral of the story is pretty clear. Like, I'm, I'm here to take because my ancestors were taken from by your ancestors. That's, that's just revenge. I mean, that's not the basis for any kind of social compact. It's not... And it, 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 not only is it not the basis for any kind of social compact, it will absolutely undermine the social fabric. If this is what the future of Western societies is going to be, groups pitted against groups based on ancestry and race and ethnicity and things like that, very explicitly saying some are good and some are evil, some deserve, you know, some deserve to take and some deserve to be taken from, we're just asking for um, strife and, and, and potentially civil war. Yeah, it's one of the running themes of your book that this... Um, 
tribalistic and uh, identity based case system that the yeah. left wants to implement and use as the new standard of justice right. can only have the effect of breaking it. I think right. so. This is a great example of the leftist projection. Whatever they accuse you of doing, they're doing. There's a new book out, I forgot the author, it's something like the American caste system, the new caste system. Yeah, or it's something. in Oprah's book club. Yeah, and so Oprah endorses it as if, the point of the book is to say that the caste system is what defines old evil America that we're overcoming, and when the reality is exactly the opposite. What the left and the elites are trying to do now is build a new, very explicit caste system. They already do it in the concept in federal law of the protected class, right? Um, and they accuse America of having always been this when it's exactly what they're doing right now. Pure projection. Anything they accuse you of doing, they're doing in every case. Um, let's, get, let's talk a bit about the regime analysis chapter. Um, I, I, maybe we can get into it by way of this question, which is, you talk a lot about and analyze the ruling class, yeah. and what you hear often from people on the left uh, um, is, what, what are you guys talking about? The rule, yeah. Trump's the, the president. Yeah, it, Trump's the president. He's a billionaire. Isn't he the ruling class? Yeah. Why is Trump not part of this ruling class, and what are its characteristics? Um, he's not part of it because he doesn't share their opinions or their goals. So you could say he is part of it in the sense that He's rich and he's from Manhattan and he's from New York and he's been prominent for a long time. And he's president. Right. And he's, well, of course, and he's, <laughs> and he's the president. But I mean, um, but first of all, the ruling class in America is, um, I would say, the, the, the generous way to put it is they're knowledge workers, right? They're um, information types, they're service economy types. What is Trump? He's a builder. He's much more in touch with um, blue collar. You know, I think one of the reasons Trump appeals to blue collar voters a lot is that he spent so much of his life literally around hard hats and contractors and understands people in a way that a Goldman Sachs partner or a tenured professor or um, a tech you know, app designer has no contact with, I mean, maybe somebody comes out to fix their air conditioning in their home and they sort of let them in and they let them out, but they just, there's, otherwise there's no contact and no understanding, where Trump is definitely not like that. Um, he's basically, he's not ruling class because he doesn't share their opinions and he, He's working at complete, uh, he's working, not just, he's not, not, it's not just that he's not working toward their ends, he's working against their goals, right? They don't want a wall, they want no wall. They don't want immigration to be limited in any way. He does want to limit immigration. They don't want tariffs or the re, um, dom domiciling of manufacturing. Um, they want everything outsourced as much as possible. He wants tariffs. He wants to protect U.S. industries. He wants to bring as much factory like, home. Um, they want the U.S. to be a constabulatory power in as many parts of the world as possible, to have our military all over the place fighting for God knows what, God knows where. Trump wants to limit that as much as possible. So on, on almost every metric or every issue where the ruling class wants something, he wants the opposite and is working toward the opposite. That's fundamentally the reason why he's not part of the ruling class. So implicit in what you just said are some of the characteristics of the ruling class, but uh, I, let's, let's ask it in a pointed way. What is the most important thing uh, or the most important tenet held by the, our modern ruling class? The most important, I think this is, um, if I can bring in a little bit of Machiavelli. Please. I can't help it. Um, he distinguishes the Prince, the Prince chapter 12. Um, he talks about the four kinds of soldiers, a mercenary, auxiliary, mixed, and one's own, right? And everybody thinks, he, 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 what do you think when you think of a mercenary, right? Well, you're getting paid, right? You're getting paid. That's the defining characteristic of a mercenary. Uh, but if you think it through, everybody's getting paid somehow, right? Mercenaries get paid. But what are auxiliaries? They're the soldiers who work for or fight for a different power, and that power loans you an army. Like, you, know, you need some guys? Okay. But they're getting paid. You're either paying the guy who loans you the soldiers, or he's paying them as a favor, but they're getting paid. Um, one zone, you know, even the unpaid Roman armies of the early Republic, they got paid. How? They got paid by looting. They got paid by booty warfare. Everybody gets paid. That's not the definition of a mercenary. The true definition of a mercenary is they're stateless. They're not loyal. They might be loyal to their leader because he provides for them, but they're not loyal to a prince or a republic or any particular nation or people or piece of ground or extent of territory or set of institutions, right? They're in it solely for themselves. That, to me, is the fundamental defining characteristic of our ruling class. They are not patriotic Americans. You know, there's one of those celebration parallax will crop up here where, you know, as long as you say, I'm a, I'm a global citizen and I'm a citizen, you put it like that, um, you're celebrated and it's considered a wonderful thought. Um, 
Whereas if I say, you're not patriotic Americans, you're not loyal to this nation to the exclusion of all other nations, they'll say, you know, how dare he question my patriotism, blah, blah, blah. I've just said exactly the same thing that you said, except in slightly different language, and I made it sound bad because it is bad, right? No country can long survive or, or th certainly not thrive with an elite that is not loyal to its own country. And we definitely have an elite that is not loyal to our country. It's not really loyal to any country. Um, you know, we have uh, elites who kowtow to other countries in a lot of ways, but usually for craven financial interests, the way you see our elites, you know, kowtowing to China. And part of that is an extension of domestic politics where, since they're against everything Trump does, if Trump gets tough on China, then they have to side with China against Trump. But that's, that's, a, that's a very bad situation for a country to be in. And I think to me, that's the ultimate defining characteristic of the ruling class. They are stateless. They're, merc they're mercenaries. Yeah, our, our good friend and, and longtime teacher, John Marini, who, who lectured yesterday and last night, uh, told the fellows, Lincoln fellows yesterday, that really the, there is a global ruling class now and it shares certain characteristics and it's cosmopolitan. It, it yeah. is globalist by definition and it's really, uh, the, especially the upper crust of it, really thinks it, it can operate independent of states in a yeah. way. Um, you know, multiple homes across, you know, you go to your bunker if, when things get really right. bad. You can kind of you know, come people, in and out of the swank places. You, sometimes when you go to, you know, overseas, you're coming home, or you, you know, you're walking through a, uh, the, you know, the, whatever it's called, the immigration line in the U.S. or what they call it in other countries. You see people like when they're going into passport control, they pull out three or four like a deck of cards and they shuffle through and they pick the one that they want to show the guy. Right? I, it's insane to me. Yeah. I mean, I, I dual citizenship. Um, Caldwell wrote about this in the CRB, um, yeah. I think, effectively. It's always made no sense to me. And one of the, I think, the most remarkable facts that just shows you what a joke, what a ridiculous practice it is, is that the very oath, the very written oath that we have you take to become a citizen of the United States requires you to forswear all allegiance to any other country. And then we go, oh, yeah, but it's fine if you have six passports. It used to be only spies had multiple passports, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, we wanted to keep this sort of punchy and short. We have much more to talk about, and we will on other occasions. But let's go out with this. Um, uh, our, uh, in your book, you, you have this discussion of the, some of the mechanisms or means of leftist rule. And you talk about the narrative, the yeah. megaphone, and the muscle. Yeah. Let's, just muscle. Run, let's just run. And the muzzle. Yeah. Yeah. The narrative is the story. It's the meta story. So the, you know, the main narrative of 2020 is that America is an irredeemably racist country and always has been. And the only way, it can't even really fully expiate its sins. So the only thing we can do is essentially practice, um, you know, this new, we can implement the new caste system and elevate groups that are alleged to be and have been victims and punish groups that are, uh, have been or are alleged to have been perpetrators. So that's the narrative, right? And you know, things that fit the narrative get blown up big. So the George Floyd, I mean, this is a, you know, uh, what I would call it basically a crime blotter story that now has become the biggest story, news story of 2020 and has resulted in the destruction of God knows how many American cities and businesses and things, right? Uh, um, because a guy who was on, who's a five-time felon, uh, on two or three different drugs in his system at the time, tries to pass counterfeit $20 bill, resists arrest for a number of minutes, and ends up... Now, look, I, those officers will be tried. Everything will come out. If it turns out that the jury finds that they've committed a crime, I'm not taking any position on this right now. I'm just saying that... that but I, I, I'm taking a position on it only to the extent that the, what the media did was criminal, right? It, it didn't reserve judgment. It didn't try to find out all the facts. Um, it actively tries to suppress certain facts. It, it, it takes this item and uses it to fuel the narrative, which is that um, you know police kill blacks at alarming numbers throughout America, which all the statistics, um, we're gonna have Heather McDonald here, I know, and I think she's here tomorrow, and she's the leading expert on this. Everybody go read Heather, watch uh, you know a great YouTube, or I don't know if it's on YouTube, they tried to censor it, but she did a video on this just showing this, this narrative is false, but they have this, this example and they use it to pump the narrative that they want to push, right? And that brings you to the megaphone. How do they pump it? Through every channel they have, and they have all the channels. So that the big newspapers, um, you know, a great example of the megaphone is this guy, I think he's a grad student somewhere named Zach Goldberg. You know what I'm going to say? Yeah. Right? He has tracked the usage of certain words like you know, structural racism and intersectionality and whatever, all of these kind of woke terms of microaggression that nobody, they were either not 
known at all five, 10 years ago, or were just considered fringe academic nonsense. And tracks their usage in you know, the New York Times and the Washington Post and so on. It's just flat, 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 flat. And around 2013, 2014, it just zooms up to like hundreds of times you know, a, a day in a lot of, the, I mean, I've, crazy, that's the megaphone. That's the power that they have. They say, okay, we're, we have our narrative and now we're gonna make sure it gets across and they start blaring it through all of their channels, through the newspapers, through the cable TV, through broadcast. Um, they weave it into entertainment. Um, TV shows. They're, they're doing it in professional sports now. The yeah. Professional sports has become, used to be unwind, watch a game to get away from all of this. You can't anymore. They, they're sh shoving it in your face. And I noticed the ratings, at least I've heard, that the ratings are down for these leagues. Um, Go golf and hockey are safe right. still. So, so I think people just, they just don't want to see it. But every media, and of course social media, is used to pump the narrative. Yeah. What is the muzzle? The muzzle is their ability to censor um, or um, suppress any story that dissents from or contradicts or undermines the narrative. So great, I just mentioned Heather McDonald. She did a 30 minute, 40 minute um, video for our friends, the Powerline guys uh, and, and Center for the American Experiment explaining the real truth about race and crime in America using you know, FBI numbers, Department of Justice numbers. And YouTube censored it, they blocked it. And then he had, you know, they filed an appeal and YouTube, and, you know, I, I think the way it ended up is they put some warning on it and it, you know, it's been tagged as inappropriate and you had to confirm that you were 18 to watch it or something like that. So they didn't quite pull it down, but for a while they had pulled it down. Um, look at the way they're censoring the president's tweets and things like this now. That's the muzzle. And if you're not prominent, you don't have any muscle behind you, you're just a regular person, they can easily censor you, you can write an appeal and they just won't respond. They'll just say, we violated our terms of service, no details specified. And all the block your account, lock you. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, and, and the other way the muzzle works is, you know, for instance, um, because George Floyd was black and the police officer, well, actually there were four police officers, as I understand it, two were white and two were Asian. This is, you know, the way they use the megaphone is to imply that it was like four white, you know, well, let's forget the part that it wasn't quite as neat. The same way, you know, remember the Trayvon Martin thing, George Zimmerman, who's, I think his mother was Hispanic, but his father had the German name. And so they, first they just tried to put this white on black thing. And then you see his picture, he's like, kind of looks a little bit Latino to me. So they came up with the term white Hispanic. That's a way of just pushing the narrative. But other crime blotter stories that, get, that either don't support the narrative or that actively undermine the narrative, this is one of the ways they use the muzzle. They just don't report on it, right? Just pretend it never happened. Um, when, uh, you know, when I mentioned this before, the Nick Sandman, the Covington case in July, or sorry, January of 2019, um, the media, went, you know, they blew it up because it fit the narrative. You know, smug white person from Kentucky. I mean, it's Kentucky, right? It must be that these are white supremacists. Mm -hmm. Isn't every white person in Kentucky a white supremacist? If you live in, in blue Manhattan or San Francisco, that's what you think, right? And they blew this story up, tried to ruin a 15-year-old boy's life. I mean, talk about a crime of incomprehensible evil for people with all this power on the blue coast to try to destroy a 15 year old boy's life. And then pretty quickly, um, full video of the encounter emerged. And this is how they use the muzzle. They just try to pretend it never happened. They don't, you know, you had a couple of examples of people saying, I got this wrong and I apologize, but mostly they just want to move on immediately and suppress it, yeah. right? They don't report on it. They, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a massive abuse of power but it's also, I think, the key means by which we are ruled, it's for now. <laughs> we'll see how that changes going forward, but it, it's by a, this kind of propaganda. Well, thanks, Michael. I, I want to encourage everyone to go buy The Stakes, uh, America at the Point of No Return. It, it's a wonderful book, uh, deep, uh, philosophical, but also speaks to our current crisis and in a way that uh, shows the stakes of 2020, of course. And, um, is a wonderful piece of analysis of our current current state of affairs, drawing drawing uh, back into uh, a lot of the things we're teaching here this week, which is how we ought to understand America, American political principles, and and how uh, we need to get back on track if we are to preserve this place. So I just mentioned too that there there is an excerpt in the current issue of the Claremont Review of Books, which is available online. Yeah. ClaremontReviewBooks.com. Uh, there is an excerpt. It's the a condensed version of Chapter Eight, which yeah. is kind of the case for Trump. So yeah. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.